Keeping venomous reptiles is an unforgiving hobby, requiring proper training and lots of experience. One simple mistake can be the difference between life and death. death, death. Remember, the most venomous snake in the world oh, is the whoa. one that just bit you. There are no venomous snakes with training wheels. Just because you see Viper Keeper handle snakes a certain way does not mean you should try it too. Hey, Viper Keeper here at the Denver Zoo with uh, one of my buddies behind me, uh, a young male Komodo dragon who's uh, father to some of the babies that uh, we'll see later in the video. Uh, my friend Rick, the curator, and the area supervisor, Tom, was gracious enough to spend some time with me today and uh, uh, roam around the back areas as well as the front areas of the zoo and give us an unprecedented uh, view inside uh, the exhibits and talk uh, reptiles. Uh, I hope you enjoy the show. And again, special thanks to the Denver Zoo for uh, opening uh, uh, up the opportunity for me to uh, uh, to videotape uh, behind the scenes. We're here with uh, Tom Weaver, who's the area supervisor at the uh, the Denver Zoo in the uh, tropical uh, Discovery. discoveries area. Tom's going to tell us about uh, the building that we're in, which is a big glass pyramid. Well, basically, yeah, we uh, at Tropical Discovery here we represent. Um, pretty much everything from the tropics except for furs. We do have some mammals here. We have some invertebrates. We have a, a fairly large aquarium and uh, a very large reptile collection, which kind of is intermixed with everything. When you walk through, um, you walk through a pathway and you just look through a lot of different exhibits and you go through like a Komodo wing. We have uh, Siamese crocodiles and uh, a temple area where most of our vipers and uh, elapids are held. And then, like over here, small animal interpretive, which is primarily uh, um, amphibians and small vipers and stuff. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, well, let's uh, let's take a hike around and see what we can see. All righty. Graphic, you know, settings. Um, we do when we do do uh, um, like mixed exhibits with multi, you know, multi species. We try to say it's taxonomically uh, correct. Um, but not, you're going to see something from Asia and then from Africa and then from South America right next to each other in the dual exhibits. Uh, just our favorite uh, running the mill cobras. Yeah, if you look right there in the back, that's the shift hole form. Ah, okay. And actually, it looks like Mark is trying to. Uh, get her to shift off, but she doesn't look like she's moving. <laughs> no, that, that's the problem with having shift uh, uh, boxes and stuff is you can seldom get the animals to uh, behave themselves and, and cooperate. Um, I don't use any shift boxes. Uh, my animals are all relatively quite handleable. Uh, and uh, Well, we, we here at the zoo, I mean, she'll, we'll feed her back there and she'll go back there probably this afternoon and spend a day back there and come back out. We are building shift boxes for a majority of our um, elapids. I don't feel comfortable getting to the point where we'll never handle those animals because I don't want to have you, an escape issue where my keepers aren't trained. You know, Tom, you're exactly right. Uh, uh, some places go too far with uh, removing the keeper from handling the animal in day-to-day -day, uh, care because what happens when something happens, and you know it will, uh, you know, it's best to have the animals used to you as well as you used to the animals. Right. So um, We do it primarily for convenience to be able to clean the cages. It's kind of like in the zoo world, a major pretty much all AZA zoos are going to... Uh, protected contact with elephants. And that's a co completely different story, but um, they are basically going to protect the contact and not going ever going back. Uh, we kind of tread lightly on that because we don't want to have a policy written in stone that we are to be able to handle the animals. But <clears throat> when you work with, at a big institution, you have insurance issues, you have politics, and pretty much but right now we handle everything in the collection. Yeah, okay. Well, I understand uh, those uh, those bad things about uh, uh, being part of an AZA, and that's, uh, of course, in, you know, exhibiting animals uh, to the public is, you know, the insurance issue, 
politics and you know all that other crazy stuff you have to put up which is far more dangerous than the animals in most cases right. <laughs> you know that they can certainly shorten your career uh, in a heartbeat Those guys we've produced like two times, I think. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, talk about politics. Uh, I was just bringing in some Sum uh, Sumatranus as well as some uh, 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 Russell's Vipers from Indonesia. And because I deal with a lot of AZA zoos, I do everything by the book. Mm -hmm. um, the exporter didn't get, uh, since Russell's Vipers are CITES too, in India, Thailand, uh, uh, Sri Lanka, but they're not on sightings listed animal in Indonesia, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife still wants them on right. sightings paperwork. Well, it came up to the ship date, my, ex my exporter sent me the paperwork ahead of time, and I sent it to Fish and Wildlife ahead of time, and they said, no, this is not correct. So I told the guy, look, pull them out, we'll ship them another time once we get this straightened out. Well, he, he didn't ship them, which, which is great. Um, they got into Florida. Fish and Wildlife was waiting there with their mouths drooling for a big uh, Lacey Act violation, and they weren't in there. Mm -hmm. So what they did is, you know how they sharpen their pencil and stuff? I had two oriental rat snakes in there uh, with the other venomous that I had, which were all fine, they're all properly bagged and labeled. The two rat snakes were CITES, which I had to pay for it for, mm -hmm. but the inspector cited them as in violation of the export permit from Indonesia because they weren't in a separate compartment, they were just in with the other snakes. Oh, really? It was ridiculous. So they said, look, we can seize the animals, or you can ship them back at your own expense. So naturally, I wouldn't let them have the animals because they'd probably just throw them in the freezer. Right. Um, so I shipped them back. So, you know, uh, sometimes the politics and, the, and the, the hoops you have to jump through to do things is crazy. But, uh, yeah, I was bringing in some Sumatranus also uh, right. because they're very rare in the U.S. Right. now. And I know zoos and other people would have liked to have had them. Mm, that's too bad. So this is a big old, uh, looks like a boy gaboon. Yeah, that was, uh, I think, confiscated in Toronto in a uh, drug raid or something. And uh, they didn't want to display it up there, so they sent it down to us. So we were pretty impressed. We are pretty happy to get a nice specimen up there. That's, that's a big, hefty male, that's for certain. Uh, not very long for a Western, but certainly he's got the typical uh, uh, Gaboon bulk and beautiful enclosure, by the way. A very nice uh, display. Uh, yeah, gaboons are uh, are really neat animals, not to be underestimated any time at all. Here it looks like we have a squamager. Yep. Okay. Very nice. Uh, and up here, oh, a camburi. Yeah. Very nice. Wagglers. Yeah, a bunch of these were on board too. Never, uh, never made it. Uh, uh, some were destined for another AZA zoo. Yeah. Beautiful rhino. That one, well, that one's tough to tell. Maybe a few now. she's in the water right now. Oh, I see a tail down there. Yeah, she's a, she may come out before we're, we're done. She goes down the water for a while and comes back out. Well, you know, it's probably easier to move her weight around in the water yeah. than uh, uh, on land. Ah, oh, beautiful. We've had, in the past, we've had good luck with this species. We've produced um, two or three clutches of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, these are, these are pretty, uh, Pretty easy as far as the vine steak species. Now you've got them feeding on lizard or on mice? Mice. Very good, yeah. Oh yeah, I get these guys in occasionally from Indonesia. These are, these are fantastic little snakes, yeah. Very, very uh, nice little animals that uh, are doing well for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've, uh, we've had that species on display for quite a while. Yeah, they... <laughs> 
they we're, can... We're going to put our green mama in here. Ah, okay. Set up for that. Yeah, you know, I actually find that my greens are mostly uh, uh, terrestrial and not arboreal. Really? Um, I offer them, you know, trees and stuff to climb in, but for the vast majority of them are, are on the ground. Oh. Believe it or not, my Jameson Mambas are, are almost strictly arboreal. Right. We got one of those, too. So. Ah. Yeah, those are really tough to come by because uh, when you import them, you get this terrible fulminating mouth infection. And, you know, I've had... I have a local vet who used to work at the Pittsburgh Zoo, knows herbs and stuff. We used to treat the snot out of them, and the mortality rate just shot up. The more yeah. you did, the more they died. Yeah. So now, uh, this last batch I got in from Tanzania, um, I did nothing to other than leave them alone, hydrate them, and get them feeding, and they've done fantastic. Clear, everything, cleared. everything cleared up. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's sometimes the best. <laughs> yeah, do nothing. Yeah. I think we've got things in there, but you have to excuse our, our graphics. We've got brand new graphics, and we're uh, going through, and we counted about 38 uh, mistakes on them, so we're in the process of redoing a lot of them. Yeah, the, you know, it's very important to present fact, not uh, errors, uh, mm -hmm. to the public and mm -hmm. stuff. Well, hi, guys, just hanging out, huh? Yeah, those are our howler monkeys. Ah, they're pretty quiet. Yeah, for right now, they may... Make sure the male's sitting up on the top there. Oh, yeah. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> They're getting going. Beautiful, uh, you know, in setting. Uh, is it really tough to thermoregulate in the summer? Yeah, it's the problem we have in Denver is, I mean, we're almost, you know, a desert. So we get about 13 inches of rainfall a year. Um, and, uh, we try, we miss, we, you know, fog this area and our air handlers have water going into them and everything. We're probably about 50% humidity at most times. So we have a, a big, you know, issue with our exhibits. We have to keep them humid um, and work on them individually rather than like if you lived in Florida where you can just open the window. So it's a lot more of a challenge keeping um, high humidity with well, good, well ventilation. Um, Absolutely. A lot of exhibits. So. Yeah, I mean, the bigger the building is, though, the easier it is that I found. Uh, I'm in a new facility now with bigger space, and it's much easier for me to control things than it could in the smaller rooms that I had. But um, actually, you know, I try to keep 50, 55% humidity in the room at all times, and then, I, as you guys do, I microclimatize their inhabitat. Right. But it, it takes quite a bit of effort. Well, we have a lot of missing <clears throat> systems going through everything, draining at the bottom so that uh, we don't get stagnicity. And we've been doing a lot over the last year, um, probably a decade, trying to work on bioactive substrate. Oh, yeah. To where it's not necessarily, I mean, we do go in and clean out and redo all the substrate, but um, a lot of it is is trying to figure out what plants work with the animals. Here they go. Uh, to keep it uh, so we can do spot cleaning for a while and then go in and maybe redo the whole thing less often than we would uh, without plants. Mm. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I, I would like to be able to switch to something that uh, would be more eco-friendly and would be self-regulating and stuff. Oh, I love westerns. I've got uh, a couple that are on loan because I don't have space for them. Uh, hopefully they're going to breed. Uh, these these guys are the ones that you really want to shift box for though. Yeah. They're, uh, the blacks that I have and the, the greens uh, are pussycats. Uh, the Jamies and these guys you really want a shift box for. Yeah. These will definitely give you a run for your money. A Vietnamese pit viper. Oh, an office. Okay, yeah. yeah. I've had this species before too. Oh yeah, I see him. There he is. Very cool. But over here we moved, this has been a lot of different exhibits and we ended up using it for our Dracaena. Um, we've had water monitors in here and reticulated pythons. Then we decided to make a more of a habitat bottom and uh, 
do the Cayman Lizards, um, and they uh, have reproduced twice a year, so we're pretty Wow, happy. yeah, that, that's a good sign that you've got things right for them. Uh, wow, beautiful, beautiful exhibit. Boy, zoo, uh, zoo displays have come a long way since I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in and out of the Bronx Zoo Reptile House. Oh, here's our friend Jamie. Do you know if it's male or female? I think it's a male. We'll have to go look at the back. Uh, yeah, females are tough to come by. I've got 2.1 right now, and uh, my Tanzanian exporter is just coming back online after they shut down because of a a big internal scandal in their fish and wildlife department oh, over there, the people that allow the exports. Yeah, they had all, well, you can imagine, there was all yeah. sorts of graft going on there. Yeah. Well, he's just coming back online and, and uh, you know, I'm going to, usually what comes in is probably, you know, two or three to one a male to female, but uh, I've got one female that that is doing real well. I lost the second one uh, uh, early on. She just didn't. Uh, she just didn't feed, and and that was the key. And I'm I'm not going to pull her out weekly and force feed her because that stresses them even more, right. depresses their immune system, and they go down the tube. But I would, you know, there's there's lots of places that would like Jamie's for display, and. Uh, um, yeah, I know Terry Phillip up at Reptile Gar um, yeah, Reptile Gardens up in South Dakota. He's got one male, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to get you know females going for. Once I get them stabilized and they're happy, and the mouth infection goes away and they're feeding, well, then I can ship them on. But that you, that will sometimes take up to a year. So yeah. you know, basically, I have to invest in the animals a to, year's worth of time. You have to do a rehab facility. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know that costs money. And you know, I am not likely to part for the part with the animal for you know the uh, you know, very low price at that right. point. Very nice. Oh, these guys, these guys are worse than some of the venomous. They'll bite the snot out of you. Yeah, they're fun. <laughs> People ask me all the time, well, what's a good snake to train with if I'm going to be doing uh, venomous and stuff? And the tiger rat snake is certainly. Uh, uh, one of those uh, animals that uh, if you can work with these successfully and, and not get bitten all the time, you might be able to work with something venomous. Well, this is when we get uh, new keepers in. This is our animal that we start them off with on how to handling techniques and how to put your, you know, put your hook, where to put the hook on the animal, where not to, and stuff to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he... It, it definitely has to look in your eye. Okay, I'm ready for you. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. You have tentacled snakes in here? Yeah, we just had six babies. Here. Oh, they're awesome snakes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the facilities to uh, to keep them there. They're they're hanging out in the back. Uh, but these are very very neat animals. Um, you just. Uh, Easy, relatively easy keepers if you've got a nice balanced tank to put them yeah, in. Yeah, uh, we just we feed them pretty heavy and uh, we get offspring pretty much every year. Well, that's slick. Very cool. <laughs> I see you have plenty of food in there for them too. Yeah. Do the do the fish become aware or are they too uh, well? Let's say stupid. Uh, I would say they just yeah they're not aware of them. The problem with uh, feeding out goldfish is goldfish are kind of a toxic, na nasty fish, and yeah. they they can really hurt your water quality. So you got to keep up on, um, to feed them this heavy and to have this many prey items in there, you got to do a lot of water changes and really be careful because you do get a lot of mortality from the uh, feeder goldfish when they come in. Mm. Once they warm up, they, uh, they're kind of pulling dead fish out of there. And the, the one thing we have realized with these guys is you do uh, have to keep a gap of air above the tank. You can't completely enclose them. They have to get out to be able to breathe air. Ah, okay. Wow, very nice. A good old prairie rattlesnake. Yeah, local boy. Yep. Beautiful. Look at the string of rattles on that. Well, it's a male, it looks like. Fat tail. Um, yeah, I, uh, these things have a nasty bite. I mean, yeah, we talk, talk about uh, 
uh, morbidity after an envenomation, those guys will really put you in the world of hurt. Well, we got someone we can talk about that. <laughs> hey, Mark, this is Al. Mark. Hi, Mark. Hey, how's it Al Kritz, nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. He's the one that, that uh, we've got a lot of family stuff. Yeah, I'm yeah. one of the, the rare private keepers that has his stuff in order so you guys can buy stuff. I, He's here for a cell biology conference. But let me show you what we do. I can, uh, if you will, we'll start over here. Okay. Um, this is our antivenom fridge. Okay. Here, looking here, we have um, every antivenom separated in a box with a number on it. Um, all the keepers have their medical profiles in here. So if we do have a bite um, situation, this goes to the hospital with the victim so that the doctor can know exactly what he's got and everything. Right. Um, we do keep some expired antivenom, um, although that's kind of up to the doctor whether or not they're going to use it. Well, fortunately, you have Dick Dart here. Mm -hmm. and, and we work really closely. With and him. he is one of the best in the U.S. for uh, snake bite treatments. Uh, yeah, I've got his number on my phone as an emergency number. I have like three or four guys I work with just in case. Right. But, uh, yeah, um, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, you can have the antivenin and you can have the hospital, uh, uh, but if you don't have a doc that really knows his stuff, you can still be in quite a bit of trouble. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I bring the, the publication from uh, Dr. Julian White uh, talking about expired antivenin with me because some of my stuff's expired. Um, so, you know, uh, certainly ex using expired uh, uh, is better than no antivenin or waiting four or five hours for antivenin. Right. And that's one of the things I try to tell all, all the private keepers that, uh, that watch me. You should at least have a starter dose, five or six vials of, for everything that you keep. You don't need to keep maybe 20, 30 vials, but at least five or six so they can get you started and they can get some in from maybe Florida or, or Jim Harrison at the Kentucky right. Reptiles, who's a good friend of mine and stuff. Well, we, we uh, our budget is probably about 20000 a year. Through AZA, we are not required, but recommended to keep all of our antivenom for every species. So when we bring on a new species, we have to justify whether or not we can afford the antivenom or not for it. Um, so yeah, and we have sent antivenom off to uh, hospitals, like get a late night, midnight call, you know, that somebody got bit. As a public institution, you know, we do not want anybody to die that um, we didn't help support. And it's kind of turned into an issue where um, if we send off the antivenom, then we won't have the antivenom here for our keepers in case of a bite. So we've kind of, I think, kind of turned into a pharmacy for a lot of hospitals to where we send it to the pharmacy there and then send them an invoice. Um, but we have to be really, you know, careful because we have to protect our keepers here. Well, yeah, and this is another point that I keep tell other hot keepers out there. Look, if you want to be a responsible uh, keeper, you have to have enough to start with, but you also have to consider that the folks at the zoo are, are really not there to save your ass, although they will, but you have to make good and make sure that they either get replacement out of venom that you purchase uh, or they get the funds to, to replace it. Um, it's not cheap. It's not cheap, and uh, uh, it's not easy to come by. It takes many hours of paperwork to get it in, imported into the country, and and you know some of the some of the anti venin uh, manufacturers like the Thai Red Cross, uh, it can be months in between batches of serum. So you're on a wait list, and and to have a zookeeper's butt exposed because of uh, you know some idiot. Who's uh, has something that uh, you know he should have antivenin for? I, I keep kings. Uh, I have uh, I have ten vials to get me started, uh, and you know I have access to others through local zoos and stuff. But uh, hopefully, I will not need that. Yeah. Yeah. And then over here, what we do, our policy is uh, when the keepers we have all the keepers up on the board. And so, like, I'm Tom, so I'm, when I come into the building, I put that in. So everybody in the building knows that Tom is in the building. If I'm going to work venomous, 
everybody in the building knows that Tom is working venomous. And if I want to go work a tank that has venomous in it and nobody else is in the building, I can't work venomous. So we have at least two people in the building at all times to respond to a bite. Um, we have alarms set up in every area where we have venomous. We have panels I'll show you here um, to where if you're on the other side of the building and you hear the alarm, you can go look and it'll tell you directly where you need to go to respond to it. We have first aid protocols as far as first responder, second responder, um, and each of those have roles um, as a call down list. Um, the other one it does the first aid depending upon if it's a lapid or a, a viper bite, um, which is going to be different. We have first aid set up at every station to where we have venomous. Our goal, like some zoos have uh, um, protocols where they take the, the victim to the hospital. Our, in our situation, we have the hospital come here, um, and our goal is to uh, do the first aid, and we have a wheelchair, we get the animal or the victim back to the gate, gate four where we have the ambulance arrive. Mm. So it's pretty much the first aid is to keep the person calm and uh, take off any jewelry, any watches, take off the radio, um, trying to immobilize the bite so it doesn't uh, uh, spread throughout them. Like a lapid is a wrap, a viper is more of a just keep it immobilized. Right, At, you know, like the, the Sunderland technique of, uh, of a compression bandage with a lapid bites to keep the lymphatic return to your heart uh, minimized and stuff, yeah. Well, I figured having, you know, Dick, Dick Dart, and I know uh, the curator, Rick, uh, was involved in the, uh, the anti-venin uh, group with the AZA right. and stuff. Right, and we, we've learned a lot through it where, to where we used to have suction for viper bites, and uh, we don't use that anymore. We've realized that that's not effective. Um, and Rick will come in here um, with a stopwatch, hit the alarm, and watch the keepers run around and do the first aid. And it's pretty, pretty uh, intimidating when you hear that alarm go off. Because first of all, you don't know if it's a real bite or, or a practice bite, and uh, you have to react very quickly. Yeah, that's great that Rick also, drills it. Uh, random snake hooks throughout the building in case of an escape, so he's somebody can grab one. Yeah, I've got them all through my place too. We go into the back area here of the temple. This is where the majority of our venomous is. Um, we come in. If you look, um, here's a good example of the uh, alarm and the panels. We have four different areas where there's uh, venomous. So if you're working and you hear the alarm go off, you know that it's you know, one of those areas. If this lights on, that means there's a bite in this Here, area. Yeah, okay. An alarm we've had to cover because we've had accidental bumps in. Yeah. And then if you look at um, the tank, we have them, they're all locked. They're all labeled with a red tag. Um, we have two Velcro things. This is a clip that if I, if I get bit, this goes on my belt. That way if I can't speak or unconscious, um, the person coming in, the responder is going to know exactly what species was bit um, and what number you saw in the animator box. Right. There was a number on it. So they can go acquire that. The first priority, if you are responding to a bite, first of all, is to secure the snakes. You don't want two, two bites. Right, exactly. Um, so you walk in, you go, is the snake secure? And then they say yes or no if they can. And then this is also used that if we do take the snake out and put it in a container, this goes on the container, so if the keeper walks by, they know there's a venomous snake in there. And, and what exactly is in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. You know, and, and the species names on it, which is, to a herpers is not that big a deal, but to a doctor, if you come in and say, I got bit by a rattler, they're going to be like, I have no idea what they're talking about, what kind of rattler it is. Uh, yeah, well, this is one thing I try. You know, so many, uh, so many herpers out there ask me all the time, well, you know, why don't you give me the common name? I said, no, the common name really doesn't do you any good. And then, you know, if you're trying to, you know, for husbandry or for certainly saving your ass, letting people know what you have. Well, the interesting in the zoo uh, world, we get made fun of a lot because we're always using Latin names. And a lot of the other taxa, um, the divisions don't use the Latin names. And they joke about us thinking we're uh, trying to be smarter than everybody. But... Yeah. It's a life-saving thing. It really is. You know, okay, you know, 
uh, I don't know the genus for, for the elephants, but if I say elephant, uh, you know, everybody knows what that is. If I say, you know, a cantile, well, the herpers will definitely know, but a, per, a layman, what the hell is a cantile? Yeah. Well, it's certainly a hell of a lot hotter than your water moccasin that you have here in the U.S. And, and boy, this one looks like it's uh, ready to uh, either, either that's a feeding response or it's a, uh, a response to, uh, uh, to say, hey, I don't know you, you're pissing me off, get out of here. Well those guys, for as small as they are, they are difficult animals to work with. They, um, with training keepers and going to a small a viper like that, they can be a challenge even to get them out of a tank like this. You know, we try not to let animals flip out of the tanks onto the ground, but these are ones that are probably going to do that. We call, I like to call them slippery, they're very slippery, and hooking them, you know, you know, I also call it packaging when you get the snake out and get it off the ground and it's utilizing the hook to balance. That means nothing to you know, these species. I agree with you. That particular species and death adders, Acanthophis, forget the hook. You know, you, you have to either use tongs or if you're really, you know, what I find a lot of time works really well is, is a, uh, I have a specialized uh, shovel on a pole and I just sort of scoop them in the shovel and move them mm -hmm. from one place to the other because something that short you don't want a hook and tail because it's going to be hanging off your hand right. um, and I agree with you it happens I don't like it but snakes like that do fall out of the cages and hit the, hit the ground there's just no way you can avoid it sometimes yeah. uh, very cool Some more holding ah uh, isn't she beautiful? Um, my female's sort of a, a turquoise color. Um, I would really like to get some eggs out of her. I know Don Boyer had a pat bunch of hatchlings last year. Um, well, these were kept for bed at San Antonio. Ah, okay. Very nice looking animal. And who do we have down here? Oh, Mangshang. And hiding. Beautiful. Look at the big head on that baby. Let me see that one. Yeah, we had, we had one that was born with one eye. Ah. That we not we kept him here. <laughs> a friend of mine just put a picture up. He has uh, an eyelash eyelash viper, um, um Bothriatus legali, born with no eyes. Really? And it doesn't ha and. It doesn't have pits either. <laughs> it's wow. it's a very interesting uh, malformation and stuff. Ah, well, these guys will certainly give you a run for your money, the Mujani, and uh, these are ath actually parthenogenic. Really? Yep. So don't be surprised if some point you're to produce young. Interesting. Yeah, um, I was at the uh, I was at the Instituto Butantan in Brazil. Uh, at the uh, Venom Institute there, and they said that uh, the Mooj and I, uh, if you don't pair them up, uh, they'll, they'll switch sexes and, and to, the males will go to female and then produce uh, parthenogenic babies. Wow. So don't be surprised. This here, this here is a. Oh, you got baby Moodas? Yeah. Yeah, I've got uh, you know, lots of baby Moodas too. You hatch those out here? Yep. Here's our uh, King Cobra shift box for a good example. And uh, this is what we utilize if we have to do something with the animal veterinary wise, we can remove this and if we need to take it down to the hospital for x-rays, we can intubate it or gas it down, cool it down in here. Uh, luckily this, this animal we has always been a great animal. We haven't had, I don't think we've got any health problems with it. Um, and she eats rodents very readily. Ah, yeah. But this is a good example of how our shift box. Is. This this reminds me of the shift box that's at the Henry Dorley Zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got something similar to this for their taipans. Um, yeah, uh, getting king cobras to readily accept uh, rodents is uh, is a difficult thing. I just have a, a youngster that's two years old now and. He just switched over. He actually eats uh, quail chicks too, believe oh, it or nice. not. It's it's amazing sometimes so what they'll actually eat. This is one of our homemade baby racks. 
Wish me luck. I won't take the animal out since I know there's not enough creepers in that way. Peek through. Set up. Hmm. Very nice. Unusual ah. species too. Ma uh, or if it's Montecola. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, really funny um, that uh, so many of the uh, there's so few of us that are uh, that like these uh, not so common species. Uh, um, you know. Uh, well, I think that's one of our one of our things here. We do have a. You know, we don't have a big crocodilian collection, but we do have a tremendous uh, viper collection here. These guys are kind of a, a fun thing. Are we, these the Aristocophus? No, these these are the Eryx jacara. These aren't venomous. Oh. These are the uh, sand boas that lay eggs. Oh, okay. And we, uh, we've been working with these for about a decade, and we're kind of getting ready to give up on it. And... Uh, the keeper was like, give me one more year, one more year with them, and um, he bred them and got eggs. Oh, awesome. But if you get a good look at the eyes, the eyes are directly on top of the head. Oh, yeah, very much like uh, Perengi's adder. Yeah. Oh, very cool. But these haven't been bred too much in captivity, so we were pretty happy. And it is a boa that lays eggs. Right, yeah. Uh, my friend who's a keeper at the Jacksonville Zoo uh, does a lot with these. Really? Yeah. Well, here, watch him get footage of them going. Obviously, we don't display that species. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's still, uh, you know, everybody needs their challenge husbandry-wise, and, and this will definitely uh, seems to be one of those non-venomous that uh, uh, would be uh, a little tough to, to get going. Well, congrats to you guys. Uh, yeah. Eggs, huh? It's good enough temperature and humidity-wise. The to... oh, those are our turtle. Those are uh, oh, okay. The Iwanawai eggs. Though that's a very rare species too. That we're very happy to get that. So yeah, you might be uh, setting them in here because our incubator. We have about four incubators that we have different with a variety of our collection at different temperatures. So sometimes keeping them in the room on the shelf might be the best temperature. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. Um, actually. Um, my friend and I just just throw the the incubator container in the exhibit, usually with the parent. Really? And uh, we get good uh, good yields out of that too. Yeah. Ah, look, a little Mr. Cunuda. Um, yeah, I produce babies uh, uh, for mine too. Uh, very strange uh, uh, story to go with that. I had one that. You know, fed right away, right on uh, on uh, pinkies and stuff, and all the other ones I was having to force feed and, and get going that way. Well, this one that was feeding like crazy came up to a, a point where it was uh, where it shed, and uh, I was away, and it the the shedding got stuck. So uh, what I did was is I I you know I wet it down the substrate down, and then the next day. Uh, I, I tubed it and started peeling the shedding off. Well, I got it all off successfully and, and everything was okay. But since I did that, that animal never fed for me again and eventually died. Oh, really? Yeah, app apparently they don't like to be handled like that. Mm -hmm. Zaramia? Yeah, I can see one here. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're, they're a fantastic species. Yeah, we're pretty happy that we got this species. Yeah, I was uh, kind of a long, long. Uh, they don't grow very quickly for the first four to five years, and then they start taking off. So we're about at the point right now. These are 08, so we're we're uh, getting close to where they're gonna probably start growing pretty quickly. Uh, interesting. And there's another lancet over there. Uh, which flavor is this? Oh, erythromelis. Yeah, these uh, these are tough to come by. Um, I saw one vendor had them for sale, but it was an old animal, and 
unless I can get a pair and I can do something with them, I'm not apt to, to really take them. Um, I also have a fellow down in, uh, in Brazil that's going to send me a bunch of uh, yearling uh, Bathrops Jararaca. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil is allowing export, but uh, the animal has to be more than one year old. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mooj and I. Yeah, they're friendly, huh? Um, they have to be more than a year old, and then they have to be microchipped for export. And that way, no, uh, no captive uh, wild-caught animal can be snuck into the shipment because the, the people have the scanners right. and check against the manifest numbers and hmm. stuff. And, and that's good because... That's interesting. That's... You know, I think... You know, certainly more of them are killed in the wild by the natives oh, because yeah. they're they're bad news. But uh, it's nice when you can have a a regulated harvest from the environment, not hurt the natural environment, exactly. but provide animals for zoos and collectors that might be interested in them. Yeah, definitely. Do you, do you feed mostly uh, frozen thought or or live? Pretty much. Um, Everything we feed out is going to be pre-killed. Uh, we do feed out frozen to certain different animals, like some of our larger, like our Komodo dragons and stuff, but we've taken it on to be nutritionally, it's, it's more valuable to uh, not freeze and thaw them. Hmm. I've done it both ways and I've seen, I've bred a lot of animals that I've only fed frozen. This kind of comes from uh, with Charlie Radcliffe, one of our old retired uh, supervisors here from the work in San Diego for a while that we always kill or pre-kill or prey. Hmm. I mostly do frozen thought out of convenience. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I don't have the time to keep after a colony of mice. Yeah. Well, uh, we, get a, we get our delivered books of water, though. Kind of turtles in here. Uh -huh. We do have a lot of large turtle collection too. Ah, they fooled you. Where's the McCord I had to burrow? Yeah, these guys like to burrow. Right there, maybe. Yep, there he is. These guys have raised some babies. Go. Hey, how you doing, girly? Yeah. <laughs> you, you woke you up for your debut, huh? Look at that. Boy, you know, turtles are so at risk out in the, in the real world, mostly from people eating the darn things. Uh, um, I just can't get past uh, uh, so-called uh, advanced societies eating uh, endangered species, but it's done. Well, we, AGA, we focus a lot on the Asian turtle crisis, and we're, we're doing a lot with a lot of the That's Asian species. That's nice, look at that. See, I got, I can show you. He's not gonna come out. There's another report eye in there. Those are some Spangler eye. These guys are a fun animal. Oh, look at that. Pretty calm, chill. What a beauty. These guys we brought, uh, we got a bunch of imported ones and uh, they, uh, one of our keepers started raining on them like crazy. And I was like, I don't think there's any place in the world that it rains that much but uh she went ahead and kept doing it and started feeding them night crawlers because in the wild they, they're more of a slug eater mm -hmm. um, and we've had a colony of them and have been re reproducing them and supplied a lot of other zoos with the same spe with offspring from our zoo well, that's a fantastic success success story uh, uh that's the whole idea is to be able to share with other zoos so the the neat species can be uh, kept and as well as, uh, uh, as shown all over the place, 
Wow, very nice. <laughs> That's a job in pump head. Oh, those are really cool. Now, obviously, with that much water going into an exhibit, it drains out and it runs down yeah. uh, the floor drains and stuff. Well, something that we have here, we're also an aquarium, so every area has floor drains, and it works out really well with being able to do a lot of different things as far as with reptiles and with amphibians. We have a tremendous resource because we're doing a lot with amphibians also, and the thing that I've found um, Sometimes a querist almost makes a better amphibian person than a reptile person. Um, and having the resource to be able to do, you know, different types of water quality issues and, and changing pHs and doing everything, it's nice to have the aquarium access here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've been finding that actually a lot of uh, reptile departments and aquarium departments are, are working a much closer uh, uh, than in, in the past, and, and I agree with you. As you know, I've got lots of experience as a reptile keeper, but not much as an aquarist. And I would be hard pressed to keep you know amphibians because I would have to start at ground zero. Where, as if you had an aquarist on board, they could uh, you know you could learn as you go and under the the tutelage of someone who knows what they're doing right away. It's it's really a win win for the for the zoo facilities. Well, pretty much the amphibians are going to soak up whatever is in their environment. Every any water. And like, you know, even like tap water can be toxic to it. Oh, absolutely. Well, tap water around the U.S. could be toxic yeah. to even humans. Yeah. Take you back to the motor area. Yeah, I, I do know Rick's the stud bookkeeper. Yeah, we have, we have a pretty good motor program. I, I've actually been to Komodo, which is a really cool place to go. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I was only able to spend a day, but um, it gets pretty hot there, and by the time of the end of the day is, you're, you're ready for the dip in the nice cool water, but sitting there watching the, the dragons is... Uh, yeah, I'm sure. It, it's, it's totally amazing, and, you know, uh, the... Yeah, pine snake. Yeah, you're only, the uh, park rangers only have sticks and that's all that they use to de deter the dragons. I find that quite in interesting and... <laughs> we built this a Louisiana pine snake that uh -huh. threatened animal in the United States. We oh, absolutely. That, and uh, did an acrylic. This is another thing of having a chorus on grounds. We, we built an acrylic exhibit to where we could have a fossorial display with a hole right there and uh, we uh, we pulled the mail out of here because we're going to start to cool these guys down for the winter to try and reproduce them but it's fun to watch them because they'll spend all morning in there in the afternoon they'll come out and sit in the back and then they'll go back down underneath fantastic yep good old timber Eastern, this is kind of our southeastern united states Cypress Swamp exhibits. Yeah, those those guys are massive. Still quite a challenge uh, for for doctors to treat bites by those because of the variability of the venom to, yeah. from one area of the state to Florida to the next. Well, we're my old boss always used to say either that that canebrake might be one of the most dangerous animals we have in the zoo or yeah. in the collection. Yes, I have uh, I have cane breaks that I've wild caught in, in the Osceola area of Florida that are strictly neurotoxic and uh, Jim uh, Harrison, who, who really knows Mojave's in the venom quite well, he says uh, one of those cane breaks will, uh, will give you, give any Mojave A toxin a run for its money. Really? Uh, and I keep telling people when they see them at shows, be careful what you have there, because it's, it's probably not your normal timber rattlesnake like you would find in Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, you know, where you would be bitten and uh, you, you would literally have hours before things got really critical to get to the hospital. I, I know people that were down in full arrest from an osteola cane break in 15 minutes. Wow. 
that's that's a snake that you would definitely want to use a compression bandage for. Oh, look at this guy. That's Bob. Bob. How you doing, Bob? Coming across the big uh, a, a big one lying in a jungle trail is quite uh, quite exciting. Yeah. Um, of course, they know you're coming long before you can see them, but. Uh, despite the fact uh, the brush in Komodo, you know, could harbor uh, Russell's vipers, uh, I still didn't hesitate in going around the Komodo dragon. Right. Um, they're they're just incredible. And okay, you know, you've got some some nice size animals here, but some of the ones I saw in Komodo were sure. just ginormous, as big as some croc crocodiles I've seen in at zoos and stuff. Well, something that we do here is different from a lot of other zoos is we go in with our Komodos. We, um, pretty much all the ones that we've had, we've hand raised them. Um, the keepers will spend about 45 minutes, like three times a week with the babies raising them. Um, they, I think these guys recognize keepers. They recognize, at least our uniforms, they recognize voices. Um, and I've noticed when I bring new people in and that someone that has a voice that's a little bit deeper or something, they recognize that. Um, but like I, when I started, I, I worked with a lot of dragons and we always treated them like big cats. And we shifted them, we didn't go in with them. Um, I worked at a zoo in Florida where we, we had to go in and shift them every day. And uh, the first day I started here, one of our keepers, Sue, who is the Komodo queen, I like to call her. She walked right in, scratched him on the head, and the animal came up, tongue flicked her. And I was like, what are you doing? And she's like, this is what we do here. And uh, I have not seen any negative things to it, but keep in mind, uh, we do not, we are logical about it. We don't go in at feeding time. We don't walk into the door that we normally feed them at. We don't, you know, if we've been handling rodents or anything, we don't like to let them come up and tongue flick us. and. Uh, notice that so uh, yeah sh I, I understand and all that is is you know a perfectly logical uh, thing uh, talking to some of the natives on Komodo Island uh, you know they said that they have to be really careful if they've cut themselves or even if some of the the women are having uh, their menstrual cycle they'll uh, they'll not go out uh, outside of the village essentially because uh, you know the problem is with any of the animals that we keep here is triggering a feeding response and you have to avoid that uh, uh, as best you can. Unfortunately, my facility, uh, you know, I try to go in and, and visit with the animal with no food present uh, and move substrate around or do whatever uh, to try to try to calm that uh, feeding uh, attack, but they, they still sometimes do that. And uh, uh, with one of these guys, uh, the outcome is can be pretty nasty, just as it is with some of the venomous snakes. Well, you always have to be aware. You, you never assume that, I mean, I see a lot of these things on TV where they feel that they have a bond with the animals and, and have a connection to where they're never going to be at risk for anything. Um, <laughs> They're different animals. They don't think like humans. I always try to teach keepers, you have to learn that animal's language. You can't go in there anthropomorphizing and thinking it's, it's got you know thoughts that you're thinking. And you have to be aware that if you smell like a rodent, there's probably you're probably going to come at you to try and bite you. Uh, yes. Or what what will happen is they'll their investigation of the rodent smell will become over aggressive and you try to fend them off and then it'll just uh, snowball from there so to speak uh, yeah and that's what I tell people look it has nothing to do with with me and any sort of a bond with the animal um, the whole idea is be able to know what buttons not to push and be able to read them to the best extent you can and uh, uh, I always expect a strike when I enter the cage. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, these guys are certainly unique. It's very unique uh, for a keeper uh, to be able to do this. Uh, you know, I have lots of friends at different zoos that work with crocodilians, and, and you know, that's also a very interesting uh, uh, keeper-kept uh, sort yeah. of relationship. Um, and you know, you never, never take it for granted, because uh, 
you never know uh, something that you just don't pay attention to uh, creates a big uh, big issue. Well, hi there, big guy. You're looking awful uh, closely at me, huh? Yeah, you're a nice guy. Oh, look at you. These are our Philippine, Philippine Selfin Dragons. We uh, have had a lot of good luck with these guys. We do have uh, eggs. We've gotten eggs out of them. We did have uh, a couple fertile ones last time. Um, these guys are a really cool animal. They, they can be kept in an enclosure this size. Uh, the thing that you have to realize with them, they're very flighty, and if they're warmed up and you walk in there, they're probably going to jump into the wall and smack their face. Ah. So if we have to do any kind of restraint or capture with these guys, we'll do it before the lights come on in the morning. Uh huh. These are very beautiful though, animals, though, with uh, uh, really nice facial structure, not typical of of uh, of what we would normally see because you don't see these that often. I think I think they look a little different. Looks like they could have been used in some of the early uh, monster flicks and stuff by yeah. the, by the face on them, but but that's cool. Look. You know the, the the fact that in the Philippines they found found that large uh, dragon also. Uh, I just hope that humanity gets their hands around this expansion uh, and habitat destruction issue because uh, that's worse than you know any of the other uh, uh, things that are killing the animals uh, including pollution if you if you tear down and you isolate them from you know uh, isolated pockets even though they might be surviving okay in there the, there isn't enough DNA to keep the species going long term Right. The black throats are very cool animals too. Uh, oh look, we're doing some head bobbing. How you doing? Lizards have such very cool, interesting behaviors. Uh, the head bobbing for one, but my rhino vipers head bob with me all the time. Spiny, spiny tail. Caledonia de geckos. Uh, nope, don't see them, but that's okay. This is the behind the scenes of our uh, Komodo exhibit. This was built basically to, one thing with Komodo dragons is there's not a lot of space for them in zoos. So we built this in mind that we can house multiple dragons. Um, everything in here is pretty much on a computer system as far as temperature and everything like that. Uh, the funny thing about this building is like if I'm, if it seems cool in here and I uh, call my maintenance guy on the weekend and he's not, he's not at work, he can probably change the temperature in this room from his laptop. Oh, very good, very good. Yeah, I saw the uh, the facility that's just made for the Tuatara at the uh, San Diego Zoo. Don took me through. That's pretty. That's a pretty awesome uh, setup there, too. Yeah. Well, this this is the exhibit, Casper's exhibit. Um, you can look in it. Casper. You may come over. This is about four feet deep and about, uh, we made a mixture of substrate in here that it, it kind of clings together when it gets moist. So it's good for burrowing. Uh -huh. uh, we've had uh, multiple clutches laid in here. What we'll do is when the female, our keepers are pretty observant as far as the animals and they pretty much know when they're gonna lay their eggs. Um, I've had uh, keepers like tell me they're gonna lay tonight and sure enough, we'll come in the morning and they have. We'll videotape them and try and get a spot on where exactly um, they're going to lay. And they'll dig about four feet down, about six feet back, lay their eggs and come out. And we'll come here in the morning and we won't no notice any difference. Oh, my God. That's, uh, that's a very, very clever animal. Well, years of e millions of years of experience. Mm -hmm. 
And you can see up top there where the uh, we have snow on top of it right now, but the, the glass is kind of a different color. That's a UV transparent um, panes of glass that, uh -huh. that bring in natural sunlight, and the animals actually will seek that out. They'll they'll fall because it'll change throughout the day where it's where it's coming down the footprint, mm. and they will seek that out and go land. That's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, in general, in most of your exhibits, you have uh, lights that are uh, daylight. Uh... Absolutely, we spend a lot of money here on bulbs, and uh, right now there seems to be a shortage of UV trans uh, bulbs in the country, and we're having a little difficulty getting what we want. But we spend a lot of our budget is on replacing UV bulb. I'll see if I can get it. Yeah. Well, I was watching his, uh, his movement uh, when we were talking about his joints getting a little arthritic, and it looks like, uh, you, you know, you can, you can see how he's moving is different from one of the younger animals. Uh, and being a little older myself, I understand that. One of the funny uh, things from Komodo Island was uh, I was there when digital cameras were just becoming available. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chief from the local village uh, saw me and called to one of the rangers. And the ranger went over and spoke to him. And the chief comes over and, and says to me, you know, can I see your camera? Because I've never seen one like this before. And he you know, I showed him my camera, took a picture of the dragon and stuff, and he goes to me in all seriousness, he goes, do you know in my village you could buy five wives with that camera? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. Let me, I'll show you something interesting we do. Um, here's a good example. We'll train these guys to go into cur the crate. Uh-huh. And uh, we have a little thing here where we can get them in. Shut that down. You see over here. And then we can pull their tail out. Okay, and the tail is where you would access uh, vessels for blood taking mm -hmm. and such? So that's kind of something that's on wheels so we can rotate it. Um, so we take them, take them down and get uh, get x-rays through it with the uh, mob mobile x-ray unit. So we had one ca uh, caster. We pulled a probably about a two or three pound rock out of the stomach. Oh, man. Just ate that naturally along with the other substrate? Well, you know, we don't know really know why he's done it. He's eaten a couple different things. Um, but uh, we think maybe we're doing some training with um, with fish and stuff like that so we can guide him and do stuff. And he gets into food mode, and then once we shut off the training, he goes out looking for food. And whether the rock had food smell on it or whether he just thought he was going to oh, eat yeah, it. That was but the big question was, how often is he doing it? Because we've taken every rock out of the exhibit that we think possible. Um, how often is he doing it? Does he? Because he will regurge them. Um, this one we thought was a little bit too big, and we ended up getting it out of him. Mm. He, we did fine with the procedure and everything. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's really interesting. People ask me all the time, um, "Am I worried about you know them eating substrate and stuff?" And I said, "Well, you know, it happens in the wild." And actually, I had a neonate uh, Protobothrop xanthomelis. Um, that got a fairly large piece of substrate in its lower gut. Fortunately, uh, it was still short enough that with a long pair of, uh, of uh, uh, forceps that uh, the special kind that the, uh, uh, the ear, nose, and throat doctors use, I was able to reach it 
down in its gut and just pull it straight out the front end. Wow. Um, but up until that point, I had never had a problem. And but you know, I, I could see a Komodo, you know, get into food mode and you know have scent on something, and they'll just gobble it down yeah. because they, you know, they gobble everything down uh, at the scene of a kill in Komodo. I. You know, you've seen enough movies of them going crazy over uh, over food, and certainly big, you know, tough bones in in horns and teeth uh, doesn't make a whole lot of difference to them. Tortoises back here for uh, the winter. These are an outdoor food, so we put these guys in the winter in here. Ah. And this looks like a crocodilian pen. Yeah, this is our Siamese croc pulling. We'll go up front and see those guys. Siamese crocodile. These guys are uh, retired from the SSP program. These uh, are pretty much overrepresented their their bloodlines in in North America. So these are some older older groups that we uh, have on just on exhibit here. Mm, very nice. What's that? What's their story? Um, well, they're they're an SSP um, animal, which is a species survival program. And that program is based for uh, zoos. It's kind of like a genetic breeding service for animals so that we don't inbreed animals. Right. Um, since these are critically endangered. Um, but these guys have, uh, in the past, have bred enough to where that um, they're very well represented in the program, so we don't reproduce them. Well, they lay eggs. And they, do the, they do the deed, but they, we just don't need to pay the eggs. Are they crocs or alligators? Crocodiles. crocodiles. Mm -hmm. They're crocodiles, Gracie. If you look over here on one of our graphics, we have a good explanation of the difference in the seal of teeth. You guys are brave in the zoo today, huh? Yeah, well, we've got to burn energy somehow. <laughs> I can't be locked inside all day. We've got a cool mata mata over here. Yeah, I see these uh, available uh, for uh, captive uh, keeping and stuff. Very nice, uh, very cool animals. Yeah. Talk about a strike. Those guys have a very quick strike. Well, if you're a fish eater, you better, otherwise you're not going to make it. Yeah, we keep going through here seven or eight times already. And we put the guys stand down, then they go through and blow the sand off. Oh, we've been waiting until oh, yes. Yeah, Rick, uh, Rick wanted some Serato 4 from me, but uh, that was right at the time where Tanzania was shut down. Uh, I can, I'll probably get some on the next batch and stuff. Uh, yep. Yeah, I used to see these all the time. Willard Eye, Silas. Really. We did something different here recently with our uh, Bushmasters, the mm. dart frog. You get a footage of the dart frogs wrestling. The sumo wrestling dart frogs here at the Denver Zoo. We uh, we built this and we we planted it up and have a lot of holes for the frogs to go in and and we uh, build a hole in the top so we can throw crickets and flies in form so I don't have to go <laughs> yeah yeah Bushmasters uh, uh, can have quite a feeding response as I've seen uh, many times um, my four animals are off and at zoos for breeding purposes uh, so fortunately I don't have to deal with them but uh, they can go from there to there in less than a second yeah we had a uh, club babies this year. We did reproduce one for the first time here at the Denver Zoo, so we were pretty happy. 
Well, these two just uh, are not giving up on each other. They'll calm down. They, I sometimes I used to worry about it, but they're uh, probably two males fight for territory. They'll break up and go their own way. But they uh, usually when you put in new animals with each other, they um, they have to set up their territories. Oh yeah, and here's a here's a new big uh, contender going to come in and get them both. Oh look, yeah, he's uh, <laughs> he's testing the scent uh, right there. And, Hey, there's wrestling and no one invited me. <laughs> Two spotted assassin buds. Yeah, those are, those are fun. Those, <laughs> those have a good bite. Oh, yeah. If you want to stand up here, you can get a good shot of our babies. Oh, baby Komodos. Look at those guys. Holy cow. We had six babies this year. Um, or last year. Well, I guess it is. Hi, guys. Yeah, there are 2010 more. Um, we're keeping them together, and we pretty much keep babies together as long as we can. And we, when we start to see problems, we have to end up separating them. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like a, a crocodilian where you keep a group together um, for a long time and then for some reason something happens and it changes the dynamics and then they can't go together. So yeah. we yeah. keep a close eye on them. And these guys will take them out, weigh them, and uh, let them walk around with keepers um, in a different area so they can socialize with you. Awesome. Oh, these are so cool. Yeah, and you almost can never see small hatchling and young Komodos because they're always up in the trees right. hiding because, you know, the large ones would eat these uh, uh, without much thinking. Oh, just awesome. Look at that. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. That, that made my trip. <laughs> uh, it looks like a Rufus nose beak snake almost. Yeah. Hey, what's going on? How's here? the snow? It's still snowing. Is that what it is? Yep. Ah, okay, hey. Amazing. Uh, these are really cool, and uh, actually you see them occasionally uh, captive-born, and uh, they're pretty good as far as, uh, you know, having them to, to keep. A couple they're... of the wild quotes I got in had bad parasitism, but... Uh, didn't make it, but uh, these are nice, nice animals. Yeah, they're they're fast and they're they're hard to sex. We've we've missed uh, sex a lot of them by um, probing them, and the males probing pretty long. Hmm. We've that's happened a couple of times, and um, it's kind of interesting. Hmm. We got a shingle back over here. Yeah, yeah, my wife would kill one for one of those. Um, she's got a bluey, but she's always wanted a shingle back. Oh. <laughs> I said, okay, well, let's classify it a little different. Oh, nice Stuff way. American tank. Yeah. And we got some uh, Tinosaurus pectinata over here, which mm -hmm. are, uh, um, these are, come from a locality where they're primary yellow. Mmm, very nice looking animals. I guess that's how people learn how, pl how to plank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much, Tom. I yeah. appreciate your time, and I appreciate Rick setting me up. Uh, hey, feel free if you want to walk around the zoo, walk around the building. I don't know if today's the best day to go out. I can show you our frogs, some of our frog area. Well, what I'll do is um, I'll grab my coat, and I'll sort of walk around here, and I'll... I'll figure out my way back up front, and that's where I'll get the taxi. Okay. Um, there's our crocodile monitor exhibit. That's how we tie well, I see a tail. There's a head right there. Oh, yeah, there he is. We've got about four offspring from crocodile monitors here. They're definitely a different animal. They're uh, more of an arboreal, kind of like an arboreal Komodo. Extremely strong and extremely bad bite. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, I've gotten lots of requests to bring these in, uh, and sometimes I can do that for a good price, but 
Oh man, I don't, I'm not really set up for monitor lizards. You know, if you want to make sure that an animal species doesn't go extinct, you sort of let the hobbyists take it and there's guy, people breeding the, the heck yeah. out of them. Yeah, they're, they're very good keepers too. Yeah. Those. It's kind of my, my realm. I, I do a lot of things. But uh, very, very good keepers, very ethical as far as um, not introducing pathogens into the wild, not crossing localities and keeping them separate. You know, people drive me crazy. Can I cross this with this? Why? Please don't. It, it, you're not being true to, to the way they were created. I don't care if, you know, uh, a gabino looks cool or not. It's just not the way it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, people uh, with, with no ethics at all about the animal they're keeping really drive me sort of nuts. But, uh, uh, yeah, the... You're right, the amphibian people seem to do it right, unlike uh, the snake keepers that'll cross anything with anything and, and then breed this, inbreed the snot out of it and then wonder why half the offspring die just out of the egg. Right. Well, if, you know, it may look like this, but you're, you're actually breeding out the production of a certain neurochemical uh, that it needs to survive. Right. Um, they're really doing a disservice, but does your uh, water system do UV filtration and cleaning? We run basically RO water, which is uh, reverse osmosis, so it's pretty pure. Uh, we can reconstitute it if uh, we think we have problems with, uh, like, um, you know, as far as deficiencies with not mm -hmm. getting enough stuff out of the water. Um, we usually do that for exhibits, so we don't have a lot of spots on the glass. Um, but we find kind of if we can run RO water into the tank and it's a healthy tank growing up, kind of like I was talking about the bioactive substrate, the frogs can uh, absorb a lot of that, that stuff they need, the elements through the exhibit. Yeah, and, and then the plants and other materials sort of balance things out. Well, the thing about it is, there is no baby green black arrow frog. One thing I've realized with amphibians is, like when I started here, um, keepers would come in and tear the exhibits up to find the animals like every day. And it was like, because um, you know, as a keeper, you're responsible for that animal. And if it's escaped and you don't know it, you're going to get in big trouble. Right, exactly. But we kind of gone changed with the mentality that we'll do inventory, like quarterly or something like that. But to go in and to disrupt the animal that you know lives under a rock is not a good thing for the animal. Um, so it's kind of a different keeping. And also, like when I started, I started breaking down all these exhibits and rebuilding them, like. You know, I'd go in there and I started realizing that they don't stink. There's not a bad smell to them. They don't. They don't seem to me like they're stagnant. And as long as you have good, you know, water flow where it is draining out, and you have a healthy plant growth in there, you're, you are having a bioactive situation where it, it can keep itself. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, less is more. Actually, in a lot of the cases here that I've seen here at the Denver Zoo. The less you disturb the animal, the better it is for the less stress. Yeah. As long as, you know, as you said, the exhibit doesn't have any odor and it looks like it's thriving uh, and, you know, equilibrated to its own natural standards. I mean, just leave it the heck alone. Well, we, I mean, we're responsible as far as uh, keepers are responsible for making, first of all, making sure their animals are in the exhibit alive. But we joke around as the reptile crew here, like, our animals generally thrive from neglect. <laughs> <laughs> to, our, to a mammal keeper, that's a big Oh, yeah, yeah. Big difference. We'll oh, here we got one guy on a leaf. Yeah, those are the big guy frogs. Where's your Emmys? There in here. Here we go. Usually the right. See that little guy right up there? Oh, yeah. Focus in on that. I see him. These are what uh, a lot of amphibian people are calling thumbnail species, where they're very, they're canopy dwellers and they're very small, small animals. Wow. Yeah, that's a tiny frog, that's for certain. And this is a one here that you basically leave alone. You feed it and make sure its conditions are all right. But... Oh, where are you? I know I see you. There you are. But very small, but very beautiful. Oh, yeah, yeah. These are stunning. Look at that. So cute, too. Wow. Very nice. What are you doing? Huh? 
You're a cutie. You're a cutie. Hi. Oh, aren't you nice for a primate? Aren't you nice for a primate? What? No. We. Oh, look at that. You like those leaves, huh? Can't quite get them, huh? Well, I'm a guest here and I can't uh, give you that sort of stuff. I can't give you that stuff. See that sign? That's why I can't give you anything. Oop! You're going to go down and bother the big uh, uh, water rat there, huh? Uh, you almost got it. There you go. There you go. Oop! Don't lose your leaf. Don't lose your leaf. Are you getting in, uh, in position to pee on me or something, huh? Oh, look at that. We've got a place to put our hands. Ah, oh, we're trying very hard to get out. Very nice. Oh, that's tough, huh? Oh, and here we have another visitor. Hi, I know you're cute too. Oh, was that a sneeze, huh? No snotting in my direction. Huh? Oh, and you must have had some babies soon because your breasts are a little bit bigger than your other uh, friend there, huh? Oops, I'm going to whack you on the head as I swing by. Huh? All right, guys. Whoop! there's the underwater rat. There he is. Good old capybaras. Who's pooping in the water? Ooh, duty! Reminds me of uh, Caddyshack. Right, guys? Huh? Huh? Right? Say hello. Oh, you're cute. Look at that. Look at that face. Isn't that a cute face? Huh? Ooh. A big yawn. I know. Viper Keeper's boring. Viper Keeper's boring. I know. What can I say? Huh? What can I say? Hi, guys. Alright, take it easy.